The Word of God according to Acts chapter 27. Uh, before, this, uh, before this portion of the story, Paul has been sitting in, uh, in prison in Caesarea for two years waiting uh, for his opportunity to proclaim his innocence, to tell his side of the story uh, to the emperor. He has, he has uh, requested a hearing before the emperor of Rome, the po po most powerful person on the pla uh, face of the planet. Uh, and so he's been waiting for two years, and so now they're ready to take that journey to Rome. When it was decided that they were to sail to Italy, they transferred Paul and some of the prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty in Snidus. And as the wind was against us, we sailed under the lee of Crete, off Salome. Sailing past it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lycia. Winter was now closing in on them. Since much time had been lost and sailing was now dangerous, because even the fast had already gone by, <coughs> Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I can see that the voyage will be with danger and much heavy loss, not only of cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the, centurions, the centurion paid more attention to the pilot of the ship and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. Since the harbor was not suitable for spending the winter, the majority was in favor of putting to sea from there on the chance that somehow they would reach Phoenix, where they could spend the winter. When a moderate south wind began to blow, they thought they could achieve their purpose, so they weighed anchor and began to sail past Crete, close to the shore. But soon a violent wind called a nor'easter rushed down from Crete. Since the ship was caught and could not be turned with its head to the wind, we gave way to it and were driven. We were being pounded by the storm so violently that on the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. And on the third day, with their own hands, they threw the ship's tackle overboard. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest raged, all hope of our being saved was lost, was at last abandoned. Since they, had not, since they had been without food for a long time, Paul then stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete, and thereby avoided this damage and loss. I urge you now to keep up your courage. For, there, for last night there stood by me an angel of, of God, the God to whom I belong, and the God to whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before the emperor. You must accomplish your purpose. And indeed, God has granted safety to all those who are sailing with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that I, it will be exactly as I have been told. But we will have to run aground on an island. When the fourteenth night had come, as they were drifting across the sea of Adria, about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. Just before daybreak, Paul urged all of them to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have been that you have been in suspense, and remaining without food, not having not eaten. Therefore I urge you to take some food, for it will help you survive, for none of you will lose a hair out from your head. After he had said this, he took bread, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then all of them were encouraged to take food for themselves. In the morning they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned to run the ship ashore, if they could. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea. At the same time, they loosed the ropes and tied the steering oars. Then, hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. 
But striking a reef, they ran the ship aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, but the stern was being broken up by the force of the waves. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners so that none might swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest to follow, some on planks and others on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Hi friends, when I think about power, well first let me say grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. When I think about power, I think about things like storms. Uh, we had a something called a derecho here in southern Iowa uh, just a few weeks ago, a mighty wind that took out crops and grain bins and houses and buildings of all kinds. I think of water, of flooding and erosion. I think of the sun and nuclear power, a, a, a natural power that rotates, uh, that the earth rotates around, and a man-made power, this nuclear power that, that can destroy uh, mighty nations and, and mighty armies. When I do a Google search on powerful things, uh, items like the Three Gorges Dam in San, uh, San Nunping, China, come up. It is a dam, the largest dam of its kind in the world, and it produces enough energy, enough power in one day to power a city like Orlando, Florida for two weeks. Uh, another thing that came up was a little red pepper called the Carolina pepper. And it's a little red pepper that when eaten uh, makes the strongest uh, heave out their, uh, their guts really, just uh, throwing up and uh, just terrible sickness. It's such a powerful little pepper. A dump truck that's the size of a tennis court that weighs 800,000 pounds when it's empty. A laser that can melt a, 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 a vehicle's engine from over a mile away. A, a, a laser that's now being weaponized uh, and turned into a military weapon. Uh, a male horned beetle uh, uh, pops up when I, when I do a search on powerful things. It's a it's a little tiny beetle that researchers have discovered can pull uh, 1,141 times its own body weight. That's like me pulling five full-size uh, pickup diesel pickup trucks. Um, an incredible strength in just a little beetle. A power uh, that's, uh, that's really beyond our imagination. When I read Acts 27, that's what I think about, is this idea of power. Uh, and, and, and you have Paul here who's waiting, been waiting for two years to give his testimony about God and Jesus Christ to the emperor. It, it's his, it's the, the power of his own calling to go to the emperor, to proclaim Jesus Christ and him crucified to the world if he can. And he knows that if he can get to the emperor, uh, and give his testimony to the emperor, that's as good as getting to the world. And so Paul waits in that prison for two years, and now it's time to board the ship, and it's just as if all these powers come together uh, in, a, in a way to resist him, to, to push him back, to hold him back from accomplishing that mission. In this story, you have, you have the power of the violent wind that is against them more than once throughout this whole journey. The power of the violent wind is against them and the power of the sea uh, seeking to sink their ship. Uh, not only do you have the, the natural powers, you have the power of the pilot and the power of the owner. The, the one in whose care Paul has been entrusted is a centurion, another power. A uh, 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 representative of, of the emperor himself. Uh, this centurion is not a sailor, and so he's. Paul gives them advice: stop here for the winter. But but he, the centurion, listens more to the pilot and the owner than he does to Paul. Again, power—the power of voice, the power of privilege. 
We also um, see in this story the power of God. The power of God to persevere. The power of God to prevail against the powers of this world. In our Vacation Bible School lessons, that's, that's kind of that's what we've been talking about. Heather did a great job presenting this story. If you haven't watched it, I encourage you to watch it. Uh, but uh, the powers of this world are often powers that are against God and against God's purpose. And, and she talked about the power of the coronavirus in her world. We, we know there is power. There's power uh, that serves life and abundance. And there's also power that serves death and destruction. And she talked about the power of the coronavirus. And I think we're all feeling that. We're all wondering, how are we going to get through this? We're all just kind of hanging out, waiting for a, 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 a vaccine or hoping for a vaccine. And, and in that time, we just continue to navigate these, these waters that seem to continue to push up against us. But people have all kinds of powers that push up against them. People have all kinds of powers. She talked about a bully that, that may be uh, pushing against you in your life. There's all kinds of destructive forces in this world that surround people who want to serve God and, and love God and follow God. And so as you are a baptized child of God, you may be experiencing some of those forces. In, um, in the psalm that's connected with our lesson today, and with this Vacation Bible School lesson, uh, the psalmist writes these words, In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. The psalmist goes on to say at the end of that psalm, Be strong. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. Those words remind me of Paul word, Paul's words to, to the men on the ship. Uh, They were men who were trying to kill him. That's another force that was against him. Uh, He was among the prisoners and and the soldiers that were with the centurion. They had a plan to kill Paul and the the other prisoners so that they wouldn't escape. Because if they escaped, they knew they would be in trouble. But Paul had a vision. He had a vision from God. An angel came to him and stood before him and said, Take courage. Be courageous. God is with you. None of you will lose your lives. I will see you through the storm. Because my power is greater than the power of the storm. My power is greater than the power of any uh, power of destruction in this world. My power is greater even than the power of death. And we see that in Jesus, don't we? We see Jesus. Death claims him. He enters into that uh, journey to Jerusalem where he surrenders his life on, and, is, and is crucified on a cross. But death couldn't hold him. The power of God gives us hope. The power of God gave Jesus hope so that he could follow God through death into life. And God was faithful. God raised him up. And God will be faithful to you as well. God will be faithful to me. Life may not be easy. We will face storms. The storms will come. They may even be relentless. They may even uh, shake the, the ship beneath our feet. They might shake the world, the foundation that we stand on. Or the foundation that we think we stand on, our our money, our our homes, our security, those those sorts of things. But those things are false security. The, The foundation that we really stand on, that we truly stand on, is the foundation of God and God's power. And God's power gives us hope. Trust Jesus. Jesus is the one who shows us the way to trust that power. As he went to the cross, he surrendered himself and God took care of him. It didn't mean that he could avoid death, that he could avoid the cross, but it did mean that God saw him through it. When you walk through the waters, I will be with you. 
so that you shall not be overwhelmed, God says in Isaiah 43. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, for I am with you. God is with you, my friends. God is with you, God is with me, and God's power gives us hope.